Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question, which is The Legend of Korra. It's a cartoon. I know nothing about it. I know my son watches it. I know it's something of a spiritual successor to the original Avatar The Last Airbender. And that's about all I know, I'm afraid. But I do know it's developed by Platinum, one of my favorite studios. So that got me interested. That is reason enough for me to actually have a look at it. But is it any good? And it's a little strange, I suppose, to see Platinum come up with a $15 title. They usually produce full boxed retail releases, and they generally don't deal with licensed stuff either. So there was some suspicion before this came out that this would maybe not be up to the usual Platinum quality, and that suspicion is justified. Now, last couple of videos I've been doing the options menu later, but this shouldn't take long. Because there isn't any, basically, resolution, full screen on or off, graphics quality, smooth and normal. Those are the only two presets, nothing else. This is all controlled by the damn keyboard, by the way. So this is pretty pitiful. You've also got a problem with the resolution where it starts at a very low res and you have to individually go through every one. It changes the resolution every single time. So it actually takes a while to get it up to 1080p, which is just mind-bogglingly dumb. Not sure what's going on with that. Platinum don't have the best history of porting to PC because they've only been doing it fairly recently. But this port is definitely worse than Metal Gear Rising, which had significantly more options. Sound settings, standard. Nothing to see here. Rebindable keys? Pfft, nope. Doesn't even have a list of keys. It strongly recommends the controller, but it doesn't even have a list of keys. So if you don't remember them during the tutorial, well, you, fr you are s fresh out of luck, I'm afraid. And then you can change the camera settings, but there's not much you can really do with the camera, which is a shame because the camera is a real bloody problem in this game. All right, let's jump in. So you've got two modes, pro bending and story. You can't do pro bending until you finish the story. So guess what we're not looking at. And I jump into this. This is a couple of hours into the game. I believe I have three of my four bending powers back and I am on chapter five. So let's rock and roll. I'll be playing this with keyboard and mouse again. It does recommend the controller, but I haven't noticed any real reason to use it, perhaps outside of the platforming sections, which may perform a little bit better with the controller. So welcome to Legend of Korra. We are in some ice place whose name escapes me. I think it's like the South Pole or something like that. So your character is Korra, and this is a spectacle fighter or character action game, which involves the manipulation of elements. Currently, I have three of the four elements available. The fourth one is locked. The game actually starts by taking away all all your elemental powers, which means the first half an hour of the game involves basic brawling with four elements that you can't actually use. So you're basically kicking things. It is not particularly interesting. And for another hour or so after that, you're stuck with the water power. And then it starts to pick up the pace. And thankfully, I've got two more elemental powers probably within the last half an hour of play. So things are not too shabby now that I have access to three out of the four elements. The water element allows for ranged attacks. And there are light and strong attacks, but there are also combos. And there's also the so-called chi ability. There's a bar that's kind of charging up there. And you can charge up your chi in order to do different versions of the attacks. And that means that you'll have more power. And say, for instance, if you do a chi attack with the basic water element, you will be able to fire multiple projectiles simultaneously. So while there are light and heavy attacks, the chi powered variants of them do have some differences. So the combo system is perhaps a little bit more advanced than meets the eye. As you can see, I have the ability to kick people all over the place, which is Platinum's speciality. They're very good at that. It actually gives me a bit of a god hand vibe in that respect. When you hit someone particularly hard, they tend to fly off the screen, which is certainly quite satisfying. Anyway, we're going back to the elements. So water is primarily ranged. It has some other stuff as well. And this is the one that I've got the most advanced combos in because I've leveled it up the most. And I can, I can pull off a, a number of interesting abilities with that, like that, for instance which is all kind of cool. The Earth ability is a slow attack. It has some AoE elements. It also breaks through blocks, and it can do significant damage. The Fire ability is primarily focused on fast comboing, as you can see right there. And the Air ability, I've been told, require... Well, it doesn't require. It benefits while you're attacking large groups of enemies. It's got a lot of AoE associated with it. Outside of that, you have basic dodge abilities, which can actually be comboed into moves. You can unlock moves which uh, actually add attacks to your dodges. For instance, the that version actually adds some water bolts. This version adds pillars of rock that come from the sky there. And you have a counter button, which is, frankly, required, because counters do ludicrous amounts of damage, and 
and a lot of the boss fights you're in are going to take a very long time indeed if you don't properly counter them, which is where the bulk of your damage is going to be coming from. The counter system, for the most part, works pretty well, and what it'll do is it'll slow down time just a little bit and then give you the opportunity to counter-attack, usually through, I wouldn't say a quick time event, it's a button prompt, and those things can go up pretty quickly and they don't really give you a lot of chance to react, I've got to say. There are some parts of the game where it'll require a QTE for the counter, multiple button presses. This is usually when you're fighting benders. I'm sorry. I am from the UK and I can't take that word seriously. Back when I was a kid, that meant it made something extremely homophobic. So it's a little bit weird for me to even say that. But cultural context is indeed a thing that we should consider. Every now and again, you will be forced into these fights with those who have elemental powers, and more often than not, if you're going to do a proper counter to them, or if you end up getting into melee combat with them, there'll be a bunch of button prompts in order to properly counter them. The problem is they come up really, really quickly, and they're very small, which is really not helpful, and it's actually very, very easy to miss it. This is particularly true if you happen to be button mashing at the time, because uh, some of those QTEs can come up unexpectedly, and then you hit the wrong button and end up getting smashed around in the combo, and it does a lot of damage, so you got to watch out for that. Now, outside of that, the game has some basic platforming elements, and they are truly the weakest part of the game. This bit that's going on right now is fine, but in some of the earlier levels, there's some fairly narrow platforms that you have to deal with in the middle of the city, and the camera perspective makes jumping on them quite tricky, and it's very easy to fall off, and that provides, I wouldn't say an instant death scenario, but it provides an instant failure state, and then you come back somewhere down the level, usually not too far, but occasionally the checkpoints are a little bit gnarly to say the least, with a little bit of reduced health. So it's that kind of standard, hey, you failed, you fell, and that's pretty bad, but we're not gonna give you an instant death. Except in some of the levels which involve riding this giant bear dog thing called Naga, which is awesome, except I get very... I feel very guilty, let's just put it that way, when I run him into an obstacle because he makes some whining noises and since I actually have a white dog that looks very suspiciously like that and is growing to the size of it, well, it's, it's a little upsetting to me to say the least, but those sections are infuriating because not only do they have instant failure states, if you run into a wall or you slightly mess up a slide or a jump, you instantly die and have to go back to the last checkpoint, which means a ton of repetition, but you also have to... Ugh. You have to deal with this just wonky auto-running segment. It actually feels like an iOS game. It really is a case of this creature is going to move at whatever speed it damn well pleases. It will constantly accelerate, and you have to move sort of between the pseudo lanes on the runner to make sure you don't crash into anything. It, it really serves... I mean, I can see why they put it in there, because they're trying to vary things up, but... We've heard things like turret segments being described as things that vary the game up, and I think a lot of us will agree that turret segments, for the most part, absolutely suck. They're not particularly good, to say the least. Now, is, is the game any good? Well, it's not terrible, but it's got a hell of a lot of problems. The first one being fairly obvious, the idea of the camera just not being very good. It being hit off screen is a real problem in this game, and since you're very reliant on a counter system, if you can't see the enemy, and it seems like the camera does a terrible job of accounting for where the enemies are on the screen. Yes, you have the ability to manually move it around, but it's fairly slow to do so, and it's extremely difficult to keep all of your opponents in view at any given time. So you end up getting hit off the screen by some ridiculously powerful ability, which might knock you up in the air, and then the benders in particular, as well as the bosses, have a lot of follow-ups. So that can be really problematic, and frankly, I found that to be extremely irritating. And it's the sort of thing that Platinum generally does doesn't fail at, which is why it's kind of surprising that they have here. They're usually pretty good when it comes to dealing with the camera, and they have to be, because they make a lot of spectacle fighters, and it's really important that you can see what's coming at you so you can properly dodge or counter it. And they haven't done that here. They really have not. There are plenty of situations where if you get too close to a wall, it's going to zoom in on the wall, which causes untold numbers of problems. Very easy to be hit off the side of the screen, as I mentioned earlier. So it's uh, it's not that good, I've got to say, in terms of how the camera actually works. The main problem I've got with the combat system, outside of the fact that they do this so-called abilities, where they take away all your good stuff and demand that you slowly get it back, which is damn infuriating. Too many bloody games do it. And particularly in a game about fighting with various elements and using supernatural powers, if you take all of those powers away at the start, you are left with this ridiculous bare melee system where it uses the same animations 
as the different bending abilities, but all it does is just punch people in the face. And the game is clearly not designed around that, which means the first hour of the game is extremely weak until you end up getting your first major elemental ability. Although after that point, Oh, gee, that's, a, that's some gnarly stuff though, isn't it? Although after that point, it actually gets worse for a time because you're stuck with one bending ability. So you have even less combat variety until you gain your second bending ability. And then they, they throw the third one at you rapidly. The game has some real pacing problems in that respect when it comes to drip feeding you your various abilities. Thankfully, you do at least uh, gain spirit energy, which can be traded in for different abilities and scrolls, which will allow you to extend your combos. That's, that's good, at least. You're not just limited to light and heavy attacks. There are there are various combos, and you can also mix them up with the different elements as well, as you can see right here, to actually continue a combo. And there are uses for that, although switching between the elements involves rolling the mouse wheel. If there is another button, I don't know it, because the game doesn't have a damn key chart of any description. So as far as I know, the mouse wheel, at least with keyboard and mouse, is the only way to switch between elements, which means that comboing the various elements that you want together, especially when you have four, when you can only go backwards and forwards, is particularly difficult. So while there is is combo potential there. I find for most fights, I just stick with one element depending on what kind of enemies I'm up against. If there's a lot of little enemies, I'll probably be focusing on using air. At least I would if I had it, but I don't. So I mostly just use my most powerful ability, which is water, because that's currently level six. Also, whoever thought those gas drops were a good idea needs to be crucified because it's terrible. It obscures your vision. It's really, really annoying, particularly during platforming sections. Not really a fan of that at all. If you do just look at the combat system on its own, though, it's actually not awful. It's visually impressive, and that's generally because you've got really good quality animations and responsive combat encounters. I'd also like to praise the dodge system for allowing multiple dodges and also incorporating attacks into dodges themselves, which I find to be particularly satisfying. Of course, you can't dodge forever, and you've got to be careful. It's a limited resource because the final dodge animation actually stun locks you for a brief period of time, so you have to be extremely careful not to to mess that up. But the dodge system is responsive. The counter system, as far as I can tell, seems to work pretty damn well. And counters are very satisfying to pull off because they do tend to send people flying and they also tend to hit multiple targets in combination with very bombastic elemental abilities. Uh, I think if you're the sort of person that enjoys spectacle fighters where you're beating up large numbers of people at any given time, well, Legend of Korra has that in spades. The main problem with the combat is actually the variety of enemies on display. It's 90% of the time these dudes in masks with a couple of different weapons. There's guys with bowlers, there's guys with this electric shock ability, and there's your regular guys, and then occasionally you'll come across these mini-bosses which have bending abilities, and they will appear either on their own or in packs that you have to actually defeat. And then the game throws the same bosses at you over and over again as mini-bosses, which is a practice that, frankly, I absolutely hate. Although, I will give them credit, they do vary up some of the attacks a little bit. This whole roller skating thing that this guy is doing was not in the first appearance of the boss. So at least, even though they're using the same models, they do make an effort to vary things up just a little bit. But these bosses generally take quite a long time to kill, and the amount of repetition in the boss fights is not particularly great. Outside of that, what you're going to find is a five or six hour single player adventure where every now and again you can end up, if you wish, going back to a previous level to do this sort of Metroidvania style gates which have to be unlocked with various elemental abilities. They will usually get you collectibles which will allow you to level up and buy more stuff. The in-game shop is actually very Devil May Cry-esque. You can buy different moves but you can also buy buffs and talismans for the next level as well as consumables which can be bound to the little wheel in the corner there. And I am going to die here but I have a consumable that's going to revive me so I'm not too worried about that. Outside of the fighting and the fairly terrible platforming, which as I mentioned earlier is terrible due to a combination of bad camera controls and slightly dodgy movement with the keyboard, you're going to be riding that big polar bear doggy thing and you're going to be fighting. That really is about it. Is the fighting enough to save the game? Because to me, who has absolutely no idea what the hell Legend of Korra actually is, the story and the characters are absolutely irrelevant. There's some fairly nicely animated cutscenes, but I really have no idea what's going on. So I have to assess this game purely on its mechanics. And it's 
I think, safe to say the weakest Platinum game that I've ever played when it comes to its game mechanics. That doesn't mean it's bad. There's like, there's several good systems within this game and the combination of elements and the general production quality on display, as well as things like the animation quality, the responsiveness of the combat and the ability to pull off extremely satisfying combinations and counters, certainly remind you that yes, this is a Platinum game, even if it is perhaps by no means as well fleshed out as the others. The problem is I think that a lot of people, myself included, have come to expect absolutely fantastic gameplay and production values from Platinum Games. And they just recently released what is most likely going to be many people's game of the year in the form of Bayonetta 2. And then Legend of Korra comes out and it's obvious that there's been no, nowhere near as much attention to detail or time and budget put into it. And it's a little bit weird that they even took the project on in the first place. I think it's probably got a lot to do with just making a little bit of extra money. And that's a shame. That's not the Platinum that I know and love. You know, I have high standards for Platinum games and Legend of Korra doesn't deliver on that, I'm afraid. It's not an awful video game. And it's worth noting, of course, that the game is not particularly expensive. It is a $15 downloadable title, a $15 downloadable license title at that. It's not an awful video game, but it's not up to the standards of Platinum, and even if it were made by another studio, what I'd probably end up saying is, look, there are definitely worse licensed games on the market, but this doesn't mean that this game is particularly great in its own right. It's not awful, it's playable, certainly, and it has its moments, but I would, I would never describe it under any circumstances as a good video game. If you can ignore, oh bloody hell, we're all the way back here. If you can ignore the Naga riding segments and if you can ignore the annoying camera controls and infuriating platforming and repetitive enemies and drip feeding of interesting powers and abilities that mean the game takes several hours to even really get going, then there's, there's a decent game underneath all of it, certainly. But it is not a great example of the genre. It is merely competent, and merely competent is never a term that I would use to describe Platinum, at least not before Legend of Korra, and that's a real damn shame. Now, uh, those, those guys are capable of producing the best spectacle fighter and character action games in the world. Like, bar none. There is no other company that does them as well as Platinum. That is, of course, my opinion, but if you were to argue the point with me, I think I'd probably win. Because there are examples time after time after time of excellent character action games from Platinum. And, of course, in my opinion, they've made the best one ever made, which was Bayonetta in the first place. I suppose the level of expectation from a licensed game like Legend of Korra was not going to be that high to begin with. So if you were to look at it from that perspective, you can say, well, they certainly could have screwed it up a hell of a lot worse. There are many, many licensed games, especially based on kids' properties, that are far, far worse than Legend of Korra is. No doubt. No doubt. I absolutely accept that. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to criticize it. Uh, I will happily say that Platinum is one of my favorite studios. You know what that means? I am extra critical when they don't deliver the standard that I am used to. Maybe my expectations are a little bit too high of a $15 game that is based on a licensed property, but hey, you know, what's the harm of having high expectations, right? What is the harm of that? I've still had a decent amount of fun with it, but I've been mired in frustration time and time again when I've had to redo boss fights or when I have been fighting the same groups of enemies time and time and time again or having to do those ridiculous Naga running sections or the occasional annoying instant death platforming bit. The game's checkpoint problems don't really help, especially when there are some fairly lengthy boss battle sequences that will start you all the way back at the beginning if you don't do anything with it. You'll notice that the amount of damage that I'm doing to this guy, even with, say, a level 6 kind of chi-powered water bending, is really not that high. I'm just kind of chipping away at him here, and the real way to do damage is to actually counter him. However, not all moves can be countered. If he ever does an electric move, that has to be dodged out of the way of. And I have noticed that when countering these, these swings, it seems to actually be kind of unreliable. Like, I'm hitting it at the right time for what I can tell, but it seems like those moves can't actually be countered properly. So you're waiting for him to do moves that can be countered so you can inflict significant damage, or waiting for, say, your water ability to actually freeze him so that you can go in and um, on that. And this, this is not, I'm afraid, a fun boss fight. Platinum may also be one of the masters of boss fights, but they're certainly not demonstrating 
demonstrating it here. And frankly, I would rather be fighting the, the groups of benders, because at least those fights are a little bit more dynamic, than dealing with these damn robots that repeat the same bloody move over and over again. And for some reason, uh, can't be... Like, half of them can't be bloody counted. Let's try it. Hit and again. I'm, I'm almost certain that I'm getting my counter moves right here. If he charges at me, I will be able to counter him. I can also counter that. But it doesn't really do much. It doesn't actually do an awful lot of damage. I can't counter this electric move at all. In fact, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed that they put the electric element in the game at all. It, it, it seems to be designed to stop you from excessively countering things, but giving it to bosses and then kind of randomizing their moveset so that they don't work in a pattern is a bit of a dick move as far as I'm concerned. And it means that these boss fights can take forever to actually beat in the first place. Ugh. Yeah, I, in many ways, the game is average. It's got too many problems for me to properly recommend. I couldn't tell you what the story is like because I don't know anything about Legend of Korra whatsoever. But as someone that loves character action games and really likes Platinum, while this game could have been a hell of a lot worse than it is and still has some redeeming elements, I, I think it, it is extremely difficult to recommend in its current state. And... The PC port, while it does perform at a solid 60 frames per second, is critically lacking in the kind of options that are required in order to make a good PC port. No key rebinding, pathetic graphics options, absolutely dreadful. No mouse control in menus, which is particularly annoying when dealing with the shop because there is a large menu there that you need to navigate with simply the cursor keys, which takes longer than it frankly should. And again, it just ain't up to the standard, I'm afraid. I'd love to say that it is. Maybe at $15 you might consider it, or maybe it's cheaper than that. Uh, the, the cost is a factor. I mean, if this was a full $60 title, I think it would be getting a lot more hate than it currently is. It is $15, so maybe, just maybe, you can deal with the problems. I've been trying to fight my way through it, but for every great moment, I have this moment of just utter and complete frustration that makes me think, Oh, why? You know, why am I even playing this? I have rage quit several times and then kind of come back to it later. But every now and again, you can do awesome stuff like this. You know, there is a good game under there somewhere. They did try. They certainly did try, but for some reason, they just weren't able to deliver this time. What a shame. Now I'm able to reliably counter that. I don't really know what's going on with that, but hey, maybe I was just messing it up. Uh, Legend of Korra, ladies and gentlemen. It's $15. It is available on PlayStation 4. It is available, I believe, on Xbox One as well, and it's also available on PC for $15 or your regional equivalent. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.